<laughs> just want, I just want to welcome everybody tonight. My name is Mary Mattingly, and I'm just going to read a few words of welcome. I wanted to start by acknowledging where we are. We're privileged to gather here tonight at Santa Fe Art Institute. It's located on unceded lands that are the traditional territories of Pueblo, Apache, and Southern Ute peoples, and have also long been home to the Navajo peoples. Santa Fe Art Institute believes that acknowledging and reflecting upon the experiences, the histories, and contemporary lives of the indigenous peoples here in New Mexico and around the world are essential steps toward creating a more equitable world. Santa Fe Art Institute acknowledges the injustices and the enduring trauma that colonization of this land by subsequent settlers has imposed on indigenous peoples. Please take a moment to, in your own way, reflect on these complicated histories and honor the invaluable contributions made by the indigenous culture bearers who came before us and are here now. I wanted to also introduce you to the Confluence MFA. So dedicated to regenerative culture, Confluence MFA is a low residency concentration at the University of New Mexico. It's a field-based learning program and an MFA, sorry, field-based learning and an MFA program is unique. The residency supports integrated learning in a range of art practices from art and ecology to film to more traditional crafts and experimental art forms in expanded fields. Confluence MFA meets twice a year at sites in the Americas in order to intimately work and co-learn with scientists, healers, writers, farmers, artists, and craftspeople, among others. Students work on collaborative projects while, aside from the residen residency periods, are able to stay in their communities. And in a program that acknowledges that there are a multiplicity of art centers, they're able to stay where they already have been thriving with their own practices and aren't disconnected from their homes. So it's an honor to introduce Cade Twist here. I was first introduced to Cade Twist work through his collaborative practice called Post Commodity in 2015 through glossy art world magazines that rightly so really obsessed about the reproducing the documentation of those 26 10 foot diameter <laughs> balloons that made up the repellent fence. I don't know if anybody knows that project, but you might. It was in brief a two mile long ephemeral land art installation of tethered balloons that stretched bi-directionally across the US-Mexico border as a metaphorical suture that stitched the peoples of the Americas together. And then I later, later learned about it more in depth through reflective writings that really tried to put words to the complexities of post-commodities practice and K-Twist practice. So introducing K-Twist more completely is artist and scholar Andrea Poli, who works at the intersection of art, science, and technology and whose practices include media performance and installation, public interventions, curating, directing, and writing. Andrea has worked with museums and in public spaces around the world. And when I read her bio, her extensive bio, to my brother, he said, wow, she worked with NASA. <laughs> so I don't really know what else to say, <laughs> except that you're a powerful force, and you're also caring and brilliant, and you made tonight happen. Thank you. My Mary. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm so pleased to have my new co colleagues, Mary Mattingly and Carol Padberg, and uh, this wonderful MFA students of the Confluence program here with us in, at UNM. So, as Mary said, I'm a, I'm a professor. My name's Andrew Poli. I'm a pre professor of art and computer science at UNM. I'm speaking to you now in um, my role as a member of an organization called SciArt Santa Fe. Um, SciArt Santa Fe promotes excellence in art science, um, that intersection that we call SciArt. And one way we do that is by hosting lasers. Lasers are Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. They um, were started by an organization called Leonardo Society for Art Science and Technology, International Society for Art Science and Technology. There are over 50, maybe even 100 now around the world, and Sarah Santa Fe is really happy to be the New Mexico host um, of Lasers. Um, if you want to 
watch previous lasers or this laser in the future, uh, you can check it out on our YouTube um, channel, which is uh, available at SiretSantaFe.org. If you want to know more about our events, we have two amazing events coming up this summer. Uh, you can uh, sign up at SiretSantaFe.org um, or see those um, as well. We do a monthly newsletter. Um, and I just want to say thank you to uh, the Confluence MFA program for being a wonderful partner with Sire at Santa Fe. And also thank, thanks to our generous supporters, um, the, the National Endowment for the Arts, New Mexico Arts, New Mexico Humanities Council, and from individuals in our community. Um, our other great partners, of course, Santa Fe Art Institute uh, and the Co Center. And now, without any further delay, um, you know, I was trying to write something about Cade, and it's so <laughs> challenging because of all the amazing things um, that he's been doing. And Noah Hale from the Santa Fe Reporter uh, did a wonderful um, article, just came out, I think, today or yesterday. Um, so I'm just going to read what he wrote, because he <laughs> can do it way better than me. Um, Art takes on many meanings in the work of Cade Twist. Um, the multidisciplinary artists and educators practice cuts so wide a swath, physically speaking, too, from music to video to varying scale installation projects that you'd be hard pressed to define him in singular terms. Twist is shown internationally at galleries, academic institutions, museums, and even along the U.S.-Mexico border. As co-founder of Post Commodity Art Collective, he engages audiences with, among other concepts, the unresolved conflicts between consumerism and indigenous cultural self-determination. As an educator at Otis College, he's also working with future generations to better engage rapidly evolving artistic and socially impactful ideas and projects. He's also in the middle of doing a workshop with the um, MFA, uh, low residency MFA confluence students at the Co Center. Um, and just a couple more things on his bio. It's so hard to pick those out, but I just wanted to um, uh, say that Post Commodity was included in, in both the 2017 Whitney Biennial and Documenta 14. Um, Kay Twist is a U.S. artist Klein Fellow for the Visual Arts, and Post Commodity have been the recipients of grants from the Harper Foundation, Joan Mitchell Foundation, Art Matters, Creative Capital, Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and just recently um, uh, part of the Hewlett 50 that hopefully he'll say more about. And with that, I'm going to press this space bar. And <laughs> sit down. <laughs>
it's just a piece uh, called Going to Water uh, that uh, Post Kamai did in 2021 at our solo exhibition at the Remy Modern in uh, Saskatoon, Canada. I uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, Gerald McMaster and it's never been shown in the, in the U.S., so that's a, kind of a first for you all to get to see it. It was recently acquired by uh, uh, the De Young Museum in San Francisco, so it'll be available to publics uh, soon enough, I suppose. Um, but greetings, everyone. Uh, the introduction was way too crazy. <laughs> too kind, too generous, uh, really lovely. Um, it's an honor to be here with you today, and uh, I'd like to thank you for sharing this time with me. And in particular, I'd really like to thank Carol and Andrea uh, for leading the charge and bringing me out, as well as Mary Mattingly, and um, also Alex Pena, who's been just amazing to work with over at the Cove. Love that guy. Love his art, too. Um, and I'd like to thank them all for their support, generosity, and kindness. And then I'd like to thank the UNM Fine Arts and SciArt Santa Fe, uh, Laser, and also, of course, here, uh, SFAI. Such a beautiful uh, residency uh, program. Just absolutely amazing. And Post Commodities had the opportunity to be visiting residents here back in 2010. So I'm, I know these rooms pretty well. <laughs> and it, it, it was, we had a blast. And, made work for about three exhibitions for 2011 so that you can really get work done here. There's something in the air here. Um, you got plenty of bio biographical information, I think. So there's just one highlight I think I want to say, I suppose, is, you know, I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I was raised in Bakersfield, and, you know, I, I come from really humble people, and um, uh, I'm the first in the family to earn a terminal degree, mm -hmm. and uh, also the first to pursue art uh, as an endeavor, um, which is interesting. Um, and on my non-Cherokee side, my mother's side um, is from Carlsbad, and on her side of the family, I'm a fifth generation Californian. And uh, I'm proud of that as well. It's nice to be a Oklahoman and a Californian. Um, and I had an odd way of entering the art world. Um, I started out as a writer, uh, and um, you know, poetry and literature, and uh, Mary Baraka and Simon Ortiz and Edgar Heba Birds were all instrumental in terms of inspiring and, and mentoring. Um, and getting, you know, pushing me in the right direction to get to where I am today and I'll always be indebted to them. Um, uh, and as a co-founder of Post Commodity, I'll always be indebted to uh, the other co-founders, uh, Stephen Yazzi, uh, Nathan Young, um, and uh, also Raven Chacon, who was uh, not a co-founder, but he joined us later on and was a member for about eight years. So. Uh, uh, it was, it's such an honor to work with artists of that caliber. Um, it's like a dream come true, I think, for many artists to be able to do that. Um, so I'm very, very privileged in, in that regard. Um, I'm going to uh, read a poem to provide additional context, and then I'm going to jump in this. My goal for the talk is just to click through some slides to show you some post-commodity work that we've done since 2019. Um, just some highlights. Um, and then I'm going to go into some work from a recent exhibition that I had um, that's still ongoing in many ways. Um, it's evolving into a social practice piece. But uh, it was at uh, Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana. And um, it's a wonderful place. And, uh, John Spiak is a curator there. He was a curator at ASU Art Museum and curated me into my first uh, museum exhibition. So we have a really special relationship and um, he brought me back into doing solo work because I hadn't done solo work uh, really since 2008. 
one show in 2016, but it wasn't much of a show. Uh, so it, I'll be sharing that, some of the ideas, and you'll be able to see the contrast between high budget work, like the stuff you just saw, and really low budget work, like the stuff I got to do. Because I had zero, like no budget, just really great institutional support. And along the way, you learn that that's really, that is what being an artist is all about. That was the most fun I've had as an artist in years and years. So um, we'll take that trip together. But in the meantime, uh, this is from a, a book uh, published in 2000, uh, in the fall of 2018, um, called Marginal Equity. And uh, it's uh, available uh, out there. Um, uh, okay. So, pro and this is, uh, it's a book link poem. And this is the project abstract. It's written as a mock grant proposal, the type you would develop for a federal agency or the Ford Foundation or something to that effect. So project abstract, take one. The way words become genetic memory. Hunter beneath buzzard. Three words that exist in every shadow I have cast and every patch of shade I have desired. Alternate take. The significance of perspective is overshadowed by measurable impacts. It's easy to live with promises if you believe they are only ideas. That'd be my recommendation. But dreams are another thing. For instance, look at the land beneath your feet. <clears throat> Alternate take. The literal translation of metaphor. I went looking for work and never made it back home. One day I woke up to golden light, the crashing waves of the Pacific Ocean, and a naked white woman with a big bush who wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Alternate take. The nature of circular time and various things. The future and present are connected by a series of hangovers and a series of misappropriated opportunities. We reach for things and pray they will bring hope. Alternate take, a credo for rationalizing the distance between land and flesh. There is no end. The way the sun rises over rivers is no different than the way the sun sets over oceans. There's only earth without mediation of one horizon or another. There's only trust and responsibility, loss and remembrance. Alternate take, structural problems that lead to various forms of abuse. It all goes back to the land, doesn't it? At some point, it will call your name and remind you of what has happened. Alternate take. A Cherokee elder whispers to his grandchildren during the final barbecue he will ever host. You see the palm trees over there by the pool? Harbors rats, just like the cinder block walls that surround our dreams. I've never planted that tree or built those walls, but I paid for them. We all paid for them. All right, thank you. Um, with uh, a lot of my artwork is really about, to me, it's about positioning metaphor to facilitate um, symbolic exchange and negotiate meaning and interrogate power and advance indigenous pedagogy and cultural self-determination. Um, I think, you know, research and, and public discourse are definitely the foundations of my practice. Um, I spent 17 years doing public policy work um, as I was a working artist. So I have a, a sort of detailed <coughs> sense of how discourses are leveraged and utilized and how things like you know time and context and law unfold over generations and uh, I really like to bring that into into the artwork um, so I'm going to jump on uh, to the to a work um, this is 2019 called with each incentive it was uh, in the uh, Art Institute of Chicago in the Blum family terrace 
It's uh, concrete cinder block walls and or cinder block and steel rebar. And with ins with each incentive, it, it's a sculptural ins installation with columns of, um, that uh, highlights a, a generative aspect of architecture in Mexico and other parts of Latin America, where a building um, constantly expands to meet the changing needs of growing families and communities. It's also a way of hacking the tax system because the buildings are technically considered unfinished. And you've probably been, if you've been to Mexico, or even in Greece, they do something real similar. Um, they have what they call castillos on the roof. And it's this aspirational idea that that's where the next generation will, will, will live. This is the substructure for that next generation. While at the same time, it evades you know, property taxes. Uh, so it's a win-win. But it is an interesting um, articulation of an indigenous worldview uh, that I think is, is really interesting. We did this in Chicago because Chicago's experienced a great migration. Um, there's a, over a million Mexican people have migrated there in the last 20 years, um, and they've become the largest minority in the city. Um, and this was uh, a gesture of placemaking for um, this generation of, of new um, immigrants. Um, it exists in many forms as a sound work in the uh, Miles C. Base, uh, uh, Bates uh, house that's referred to as a wave house. Um, this was, we were in Desert X, and um, this house was being remodeled uh, from the ground up, and we had an opportunity to locate a sound installation in the actual construction site. And the sound installation was a pedagogical feedback project where we interviewed all of the leaders, thought leaders of the mid-century modern home movement, because it's quite a movement with a lot of cachet in Southern California. Um, and we got their idealism, their dreams, and their, their concepts of stewardship and ownership and they talk about these homes as art pieces, so they call them pieces. Uh, but um, we also investigated their anxieties, which are Mexicans, Indians, wind, and earthquakes. So we did a, uh, we recorded all those sounds that represent their anxieties, as well as uh, direct tape recordings of our interviews with them very ethnographic uh, in nature. We followed the old ethnographic uh, methodology uh, for that. And those were playing on boom boxes just embedded in the construction site. And it, it played for three months and the house really evolved over that time. And as the house evolved, the boom boxes were moved around. And it was a really fun piece. And that's an image of it in progress. That led to this truck hunting near Agua Caliente Reservation. Um, this was done in 2021, and um, we did this for the Remy Modern um, Museum. Um, it was this idea of, you know, this iconic zigzag uh, roof line that you see a lot of in mid-century modern uh, houses. Um, this roof line was designed in 1954 by the architect Donald Wexler, and so we had this idea um, of like truck hunting, you know, driving the truck through a job site, hopping the fence, cutting the roof line off, throwing that back in the truck, and then driving it home, and then throwing it in the gallery like a taxidermy of that uh, post World War II American idealism, you know, like a trophy. Um, really fun piece, um, real simple. And this is let, let Us Play for the Water Between Us. This is uh, 2020. Um, this is a 2200 gallon uh, polyethylene um, hazmat chemical storage uh, container. It's used in farms, um, industrial farming. Uh, a lot of times they'll uh, put hydrochloric acid in there for mixing fertilizers and pesticides. 
and uh, there's, there'll be three tanks, and they're all uh, funneled and mixed together. Um, we did this for a show in, in Minnesota originally. That's where it was commissioned by the Minnesota Minneapolis Institute of, of Art. And what you see in this image is the tank. There's a drum, uh, a brushless motor inside that bangs out a rhythm. It goes from four seconds to eight seconds. It increases in, vo in speed every 10 milliseconds. So it goes all the way to eight, then back down to four. So it has this sh very shifting sense of time. You can't really get a sense of where the, what is holding the rhythm, because the rhythm has no center to it. So, and it's a sub bass, really boom. And it's in this rotunda, um, that, which served as a resonator uh, for the piece. So it really had a strong presence. Um, and we also had the opportunity to do a, um, an intervention. Uh, we removed the decipher, dis, deciferous, is that how you say uh, the Greek statue, which was right here. Uh, we asked, we negotiated with the director, the board, to have it removed, and all of the other Greek uh, artifacts that were in that area, we left their, you know, the spaces there that they were shown on, um, as if uh, they were just struck and taken down. We wanted to do that just to create a, a space uh, for indigenous discourse without, with clarity. So, a uh, fun piece. And then you saw Going to Water, uh, 2021, same show at, at the Remy Modern. Um, and uh, this, oh, sorry, this piece is actually documenting um, the uh, Owens Valley. Anyone familiar with the Owens Valley? Yeah, Eastern Sierras, you know the history. Uh, uh, Chinatown, the movie, was made uh, telling the story of water being illegally diverted um, to, to L.A. And uh, uh, that's a story I've wanted to tell in, in an art context for quite some time. And we were able to do that. Um, and uh, Cristobal, my collaborator in Post Commodity, uh, he's from Alcalde, uh, just right up the road, uh, Chicano, uh, um, he's, uh, uh We composed that music together. and. We played instruments we'd never played before. He played a trombone and I played a synthesizer. <laughs> and, um, but we gave ourselves two months to figure it out and, to, and we worked like hell to create a 10 minute piece of music. But we wanted to create the saddest song that we have the capacity to make. That was the goal, just a really beautiful, sad piece to go along with that, those visuals. And the video you see in that, it is, there are 22 cameras that monitor the Owens Valley. Uh, it's dust mitigation effort is what's going on. It's an intergovernmental project, uh, state, federal, uh, county, and tribal. And uh, the problem is, as that water was diverted, you know, the, the lake bed dried up, and the particulate matter, the dust, blows in the wind. It's a very windy place. And you have some of the highest instances of cancer in the United States in, in that area. And it, of course, it's adjacent to three tribes. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a real fun piece uh, to put together because in many ways it's, it's simply a ready-made. We took the videos uh, that, are, that are taken every day, they're documented, and, and archived. And um, we got into the archive and we took the windiest day of the year up in 2021 at that time, it was like February 15th or 16th or something. And uh, the timestamps on each of the videos. And we just downloaded the videos and literally just brought them up to Canada and configured them in this, in this manner and played them on a loop of the windiest day of the year thus far. Um, this is a piece, South by North is also North by South, um, same show, um, 
This was considering the four-sided pyramid and the mounds of the America as interconnected architectural forms and juxtaposing these architectural forms with how barrels are used that are used to contain radioactive material, um, how they're commonly stacked and stored in um, warehouses uh, uh, and below ground. Um, the photos that we found of the storage is quite alarming. Um, uh, imagine this pyramid, but with a bunch of random cans in October. You know, that would be how the stuff is stored. Um, so uh, the exhibition that we did in Saskatoon, it was four hour drive, a little bit less than four hour drive from two, the two largest uranium mines in the world uh, in the Athabascan Basin uh, on tribal lands. Um, so we felt a, uh, an obligation to make a connection um, between the military industrial complex in Canada and here in New Mexico where Cristobal's from. Cristobal's father um, died of cancer and complications from cancer as a result of his exposure to nuclear material when he was working in the labs as a janitor. So this is a homage to his father in many ways. Um, it's a piece uh, called uh, uh, Snake Meat, and um, it's also part of the same uh, show. We use debris booms. Uh, they're used in waterways um, to help filter out some, some debris. Um, and we're using the colors that um, signify the uh, hazmat color uh, rainbow there of uh, red, white, yellow, blue, which are also medicine colors for a lot of tribes in, in North America and Mexico, uh, Central America and South America. So uh, uh, really beautiful spot to, to hang uh, a large scale work. Um, and we had those uh, booms custom made from the manufacturer. And then this is called Facing the Wall. Um, it was in the Picasso Gallery at the place. They're, they're the lar they have the largest collection of Picasso prints. And um, they had a show that was curated there uh, with uh, art from Oceania and um, Mexico, or in Africa. And um, what we wanted to do was just have the work face the walls so that the indigenous created work that was commodified uh, or inspired um, Picasso so that it could be, you know, shown in a way with reverence and respect without having to be compared to a European, quote, master. It could just stand on its own be on its own. So that was an intervention that we were, that we negotiated for months and months uh, to be able to do and it worked out. Um, we were really excited about that. So imagine a whole gallery, there's just two slides, but uh, it's, it was fun. And this is a piece, Elders First, another multi-channel video installation of sound. Um, you know, we wanted, to respond to elders being treated as speculative material within the silver economy. That's what they call it, the silver economy. Um, we were doing a discourse analysis of, of elder uh, silver economy discourse on, um, on social media and um, we're really disturbed by um, how elders were just purely being presented as economic material. Um, just so disrespectful, just couldn't believe it. And then we were thinking, you never see artwork about elders in contemporary art museums. You just don't. It's like elders are forgotten in this world and it's just ridiculous. So we just wanted to pay respect and just assert that we're all in it together, elders and young alike, um, in terms of resisting this uh, you know, neoliberal kind of discourse. 
Um, and the, the, this brings me like to the real heart of the matter here in, in this talk is um, I had to come up with a title for the talk and I used uh, the sovereignty of context and um, I did that because um, it's an evolving proposition and it continues to grow out of conversations that I've had with one of my mentors, uh, Roberto Padoya. Um, uh, it, it's a complicated conversation and it's been going on since 2005. So and it, it's getting better, getting more defined. We need to do a book together and hopefully that can happen. But um, in a nutshell, just to define this term for you, I'll give you a very verbose definition that's unwieldy, kind of like every, everything that I do is a little bit. But um, it's when an aspiration, like reconnect what has been divided, you know, when this aspiration is shared across a critical mass of stakeholders, like uh, community, public, private, nonprofit, cartel, across a critical mass of interconnected contexts like the environment, uh, the, <coughs> the environment, the economy, healthcare, public safety, um, education, governance, borders, etc. A density of intersectionality is achieved, where mutual interests transcends boundaries. And that's a really important thing. And when I say boundaries, I mean physical, spiritual, social, cultural, political, and economic. And it takes on, as this density of intersectionality grows, it takes on a life of its own and a will of its own. And for a moment in time and space, community of will acquires the capacity to supersede the wills of sovereign nations. And militaries, states, and cities, police forces, and cartels. Uh, it reveals the structural limitations um, as they become porous. Uh, the sovereignty of context is realized in this case, in the case that I've experienced working with Post Commodity in doing the repellent fence back in 2015 on the border, U.S. border, uh, Mexico, uh, in Agua Prieta, and Douglas, Arizona, um, sovereignty of context is realized when thousands upon thousands of cubic feet of hazmat material, in this case helium, are transported across international borders through a port of entry that does not receive hazmat materials without a permit, without a dollar spent. It is realized when land that intersects the jurisdictional boundaries of city, state, federal, international, and cartel are set aside collaboratively for the purposes of reimagined ceremony and for the purposes of bringing an aspiration uh, into this world through symbolic exchange, community action, and the displacement of administra administrative reality. Um, that's what we experienced. Um, when we did repellent fence. That was the top outcome. So that conversation that I'd been having with Roberto, it started in 2005 at a, at a poetry event uh, that the Tucson uh, Poetry Center hosted. Um, and uh, it reached maybe a critical point in 2015 because he was there. He was a keynote speaker at a symposium we had uh, in conjunction with that event. And you know that's where we realized what it was that we were talking about, what's really possible. And it's not that art changes people or realities, but it creates fissures that can be momentarily realized, little portals where Community self-determination just simply can't be defeated, you know. And we were, were the fortunate benefactors of that. And our work wouldn't have been possible without the sovereignty of context. And um, I'm going to talk now about a few works 
that may demonstrate this in a different way, a very particular way, but um, we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked about this new work yet. I have never talked about my own work, well, I haven't talked about my own work since 2008 in public, so mm -hmm. a little nervous. But I'm going to be talking about uh, five works, load-bearing prayers, civil engineer, fire, your scent is still here, and parachutes are not sovereigns. And I'll close with that, and I'll play that video for you because it has a sound component that's very nice. We're going to run over time, if that's okay, because we started a little bit late. Um, all right, so this is load-bearing prayers. And this is... Um, a sculptural intervention in the shape of a seven foot heptagon, which is a seven sided polygon. The uh, geometric shape is a heuristic um, for my Cherokee worldview. Um, and it, because it represents a configuration of our ceremonial grounds, um, with each line segment representing one of the seven clan arbors. Um, and seven directions, seven colors, seven worlds, seven heavens. Um, so when you look at this, any Cherokee that knows where they came from, when they see that, they know that we're talking about Cherokee things. You don't have to say a, a single word. That semiotic says it all. And uh, so what I did was I cut that into the wall, a load-bearing wall, in the, the gallery space, um, routed it in there. Um, so it's a quarter inch deep into the uh, gypsum of the uh, drywall. And uh, uh, just a beautiful, formal, minimalist, uh, interventionist type of piece. Um, it just had a beautiful presence. My in initial goal with this piece was because the entire exhibition, I should you know, it's called to keep a fire, which is a Cherokee saying, wherever you go, keep a fire. That means we're people of the fire, so keep that with you. Don't lose track of where you came from. And um, the, uh, I wanted to write little text poems on each segment that dealt with different anxieties that uh, that I deal with as an OCD person. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was going to do it with this brown ink and use all of our seven medicine colors um, for each direction, for each clan. And um, I saw this shape and I couldn't do it. It was done. And usually, like, I've never made a piece where what was in my head didn't come out. You know, I've just been fortunate that way. This is the first piece that part of it was in my head, but the rest I just couldn't bear to violate this. It said it all. There's nothing more that I can say. And what's great about this piece and in inscribing it, a worldview into this building, is there's a scar now. Like, the patching of that wall that it'll never be perfect. You'll always be able to see the outline. You know, always. And it's things, but I learned that technique from with post commodity when we cut a hole in the floor at the ASU Art Museum uh, to expose the earth. Um, there, there will always be, a, well, that building has since been demolished. But <laughs> until it was demolished, <laughs> there was a scar on the floor from where it was patched. And there's a scar on the floor because we restaged that work um, uh, in Sydney, Australia at the Museum of South, New South Wales. That scar is still there in the basement where the work was staged. So that was a goal for me was to, to place this within the institution where it, can no, it can't be touched. It can't be violated. It just exists with its own will. And um, you can see it here in relation to another work that I'll talk about. And this is called Civil Engineer. And it's uh, 
a mixed media sculpture with propane tanks, cinder blocks, uh, ladders, uh, wood beam, uh, a come along, steel chain, toe strap, an LT3 uh, uh, Chevy motor, uh, 350 uh, small block V8, a 700 turbo hydromatic transmission. Um, I wish I had that in my car. Uh, um, and uh, it's an installation view. Um, uh, Spiak took the, took the photo. Um, but this is something, um, this work was based on a DIY mechanics improvised engine ho hoist that was captured by a grainy photo that has been passed around on Facebook groups. And it was like the most irrational thing I'd ever seen before. <laughs> and the most precarious, dangerous thing. And I can tell you, flammable, explosive, <laughs> that's working in small art spaces. You have freedom to work with bombs. Because each one of these is a bomb. Um, but it's interesting, it's physics, right? Um, this is about 1,700 pounds with the transmission and the motor. Um, that's distributed through eight points, through two ladders that have 500 pounds each of capacity, low, 700 pounds of low capacity. So uh, that beam has 5,000 pound load capacity. There's nothing drilled down, there's nothing stabilized, it is purely just balancing on its own. And it worked. You could just crank that hoist, no problem. That come along, pulled that engine off the floor, and then it dropped just as easy, stable as you can imagine. Wild. <laughs> but at the opening was another story. At the opening, um, there were two young lovers taking a selfie <laughs> and backed into the ladder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't move anything, but scared everyone. Like the whole room went. <gasps> but yeah, and so that was up for three months. Uh, it didn't bend. There was a crack, a, a horizontal crack that went across the whole thing, and that's it. Um, but that's a, like a monument. It takes the shape of an arbor, uh, in a way. Um, it's a it's a monument to, you know, this to speed and power and brute force um, and also the potential consequences that relate to those things and that sense of impending doom and anxiety that really hits you in the chest that's what I really wanted to address just the anxiety of this fast world we live in, where speed is the dominant medium. Speed is everything. Speed is money. Speed is power. Speed is politics. Speed is global domination. Speed is being everywhere and nowhere. Speed is being the ultimate consumer and the ultimate manufacturer and the ultimate uh, you know, manager of logistical supply chains. So I just wanted to create this ultimate metaphor of American imperialism and absolute vulnerability and irrationality because American imperialism is so violent and irrational that I think an image like this really speaks to irrationality, right? Um, so that was a, was a goal, um, anxiety. Um, this uh, piece is uh, called Fire. It's a multi-channel um, video sculpture. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about decolonization and whatnot. And it's a really tough situation. Um, and, you know, this work it embodies a, a Cherokee cultural and spiritual values that are associated with keeping a fire, in a way. Um, you know, because we're people, the fire, as I said earlier, and fire central to our ways of knowing and being and doing. However, in this instance, um, these values are complicated by histories of colonial violence and land squatting and political subjugation and resentment. Uh, the land once held in common is now held in private 
with individually owned homes standing on each plot. This video was taken of a house fire in Georgia, northern Georgia, which is close to where my family's from originally. And um, I imagined this fire as being an act of decolonization. But the fire here is emotionally troubled vision of reclamation. Clearly burning down colonizers' homes is not appropriate. It's not an appropriate endeavor of decolonization and it does not reflect Cherokee cultural values. Instead it is intended to interrogate the complexities and often contradictory aspirations of decolonization. So it's a provocative work to think about the complexities that we're faced with. Not wanting to destroy people, but just to think about those complexities because it's so easy to fall out of your mouth, decolonization. It's such a pop word and everywhere you go, decolonize this, decolonize that. What is the real meaning of that? The real meaning is harmful to a large number of people. Um, and Cherokee way, in a lot of Indian ways, we pray for all people when we pray. We don't just pray for ourselves, our family, our community. We also pray for all of you. We pray for all races, all people, all cultures. You know? And so I did this as a way to confront that idea of us versus them antagonism, that we're stuck together and we have to learn to live together and we have to develop dialogical models for doing that, you know? And um, this is one mode of investigation and I'm continuing that sort of trajectory. Um, this shows you the work in relation to the exhibition. Um, uh, and then here's a, a piece. Um, your scent is still here. And does anyone know what that is? Can you recognize it? It is. It's filled with fabuloso. Oh, the F word. Fabuloso. Um, this is probably the best work of art I've ever made in my life or ever been associated with. This is like a true, meaningful, dialogical piece. <laughs> I had no idea it was going to be that way. Um, that I, we were talking today in a workshop uh, about unintended consequences, how they aren't necessarily, they don't have to be good, they don't have to be bad, um, they can be both. Um, uh, no judgments. But my goal was just to bring that scent of fabuloso in because it is the scent of the Americas. And I'm building, to keep a fire, I'm building this really deranged ceremonial grounds. And I needed the smell like medicine of what America is. Fabuloso is the number one cleaning product in the Americas. It is originally from Venezuela. During the Reagan administration, it was acquired by uh, by uh, Dow uh, Chemical, and then it. Yeah. <laughs> so it uh, uh, and is now owned by uh, I can't remember the name of the soap company, um, but it's changed hands. It's still American owned now, uh, but uh, originated in Venezuela, migrated with neoliberalism uh, in, in into the U.S. And it's a, a very, it's a scent that's really strong, but it's ubiquitous. Every, you know, anytime you go into a non-white community, that's a smell that you come across, and especially in Latin America, um, but especially in LA, uh, in Phoenix, in Bakersfield, it's everywhere. Um, and, but I didn't know it was, I knew it was a prompt. You know, it's a smell piece, it's a smell sculpture. <laughs> And I love that. Like the first smell piece that I was ever exposed to is like the 2004 Whitney Biennial. In the old Whitney building, they had a base, in the basement, they had a piece that smelled crazy, like musty oil, 
you know, it had barrels and ropes and stuff, and it was all soaked in this oil to cure it, and it had that kind of smell. And it was like, wow, that's the first smell art piece I've ever experienced. I've always wanted to do one. So this was the opportunity. Spiak wanted me to do a solo show with my own stuff, so <laughs> we have Fabuloso, 75 gallons oh of it. Uh, <laughs> what is so badass is um, Mexican people, because uh, San, this was in Santa Ana, and there's it's uh, the largest concentration of uh, you know first and second generation Mexicans in in California, and um, a lot of Mexican people came into the gallery space, and they would say stuff like, "Oh, that smells like my grandma's house," or "That smells like Sundays." You know, they had all these like real positive memories and associations. And then they would talk about, you know, what that meant as they walked away. And then you'd walk over and there's these Orange County types that are just like <laughs> looking into that water and cursing Mexicans oh, no. and cursing illegals and cursing, you know, Latin Americans. No. Like literally loud so that everybody could hear them, everybody could understand their dissatisfaction. And that smell was a little too much because as it turns out they had to shut the building down oh. <laughs> for two days <laughs> <laughs> the workers refused to work because it was so noxious <laughs> and so overwhelming because it sat there then they closed the doors and that got sucked into the HVAC system and oh it was so rad All, I, the only thing that was missing from that is, is like some fabric softener, like <laughs> suave tell, you know, that that's my next thing, is like just suave tell. But um, it's just standing in solidarity. You know, this is, um, you know, a lot of people think American Indians or Indian people, like our border defines it, and then there aren't Indians south of the border, there's just illegals. And the truth of the matter is, you know, a significant number of indigenous people, far more than are, that are in the United States and Canada combined, that we pale in comparison to other countries. While we may have the rights of sovereignty and we have political organizations, tribes, that has been taken away from many tribes in Latin America, um, we're land-based, you know, they're land-based. We have a legal framework that supports our relationship with our land, they don't. But the practice of indigeneity is just as intense, just as important, just as real, just as valid, and deserves the same respect as any American Indian here. And that was what I wanted to bring into that space. My hope was just to acknowledge that. I didn't want to create a race war, you know, or some, you know, something that would give people an excuse to insult others, but that, that's what resulted from it. So the power of the smell and, and it accessing that cave person in your head, that undeveloped you know thing where the flight, fight or flight mode, that'll do it every time, fabuloso. That's the heuristic to cutting that. And this is how it, relate, it you know, related to the work in the exhibition. But it really is, I think, the most meaningful work I have ever made. And it's really beautiful, too. That color, it just takes light, and it just pops. And it reminded me of, like, uh, looking at a lowrider, you know? <laughs> like, like seeing a candy paint with all those, you know, 20 layers of paint. And, you know, when you do that lowrider paint, you're mixing paint as you're laying it down. Each layer is creating that color. And I saw that. It's just so beautiful. I love it. And I got to take a bunch with me. And we distributed this out to people. Uh, and then this is the last piece I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, it's called Parachutes Are Not Sovereigns. 
and it's a single channel video with sound. And this work juxtaposes uh, parachute failure with prayers in indigenous languages in English. And it is common practice, as I said earlier, that Cherokees and other tribal people pray not just for the best interests of family and friends, but also the best interests of all interconnected beings. And um, humans, animals, insects, flora, fauna, air, land, water, celestial bodies, even inanimate objects, they're in all our prayers. We even pray for our colonizers. Um, and speaking of which, this uh, video is of skydiving. And skydiving is a widely held bucket list endeavor for affluent colonizers and uh, in the USA and Canada. And so in many ways you could think of skydiving as a neoliberal pastime uh, that, you know, it embraces, it kind of like embraces the promise of freedom while demonstrating status and courage and the capacity to overcome the laws of physics. Uh, for every time a, an affluent colonizer jumps from a plane with a parachute, that person also jumps inadvertently into the prayers of thousands of indigenous people. And for this piece, uh, I'll, I'm going to play the video for you. I apologize for it ahead of time. Uh, I went on the internet and went on the YouTube and I googled Indian conferences and, or searched Indian conferences prayers and I got a bunch of Indian conferences and the opening prayers for these conferences I spent 17 years going to Indian conferences working with subcommittees at National Congress of American Indians affiliated tribes Northwest Indians um, and all these regional meetings and government to government consultations and all these things. And um, it's always amused by the prayers because they're so impersonal, but they're so verbose at the same time. It's a, it's a chance for people to exaggerate their status as traditional, as thoughtful, or to pontificate in public. It's an ego thing. Prayer is has gone from contract to ego in some ways. And um, so I'm gonna, I organized it into a little sound piece. And it's really a sound piece that uses the anxiety of a parachute not opening to hold the viewer hostage uh, long enough to hear the sounds. Because a lot of times, you know, the average viewer walks into an installation room, spends less than one minute. So you have 50 seconds, 45 seconds to connect, to communicate your something you worked on for God knows how long. Uh, so I, I thought this might be an interesting strategy. Give them something <laughs> violent, failure, you know, just classic uh, American neoliberal mechanism for selling products. Um, and then... Use it as a mask for... Um, Today we are praying yeah. in our own way for our people. We were taught that we are the caretakers of our earth. And we must band together as one soul, one spirit, and one body. Today I offer this prayer to all of us and for those who cannot be here in body but are here in spirit. That we pray and we ask that you help us friends. We all become one voice and the spirit. Please help them. Please protect them. Please go find love and give. Please let their heart heal from the I just want to ask my elder, elders for forgiveness for saying our prayer in English because I'm continuing to learn our Lakota language. 
to question the whole people for another a new day, question the confer for Kanija as they deal with adversities. I confer on Chi Nakakas during this time because a seriousness of confusion, concern, crisis that we deal with, and I pray that we give them guidance, understanding, and strength to crush as we move forward. We crush the train and ask that we continue to watch over our homeless relatives as they have the same struggles as the rest of us do, or even worse. We crush pray for my colleagues and ask that you keep their minds clear, keep their minds positive, and guide them to continue to work for the people. I hope you want to crush for everything you give to me that you will allowed me to accomplish, allowed me to take on to question. Okay, we talk to you. Questions? Yeah, what do you mean by neoliberal? <laughs> <laughs> Is that all of us or what? Uh, well, neoliberalism was. Are, are you serious? Yeah. yeah. Uh, neoliberalism is an economic theory that was really developed in the late 70s and uh, or it was administered in the late 70s and 80s. Thatcher and uh, Reagan are two of the big figures that are perceived as the big drivers of neoliberalism but its roots are in the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, Feldman, uh, he worked with Friedman, the, Friedman sorry. Friedman worked with the, uh, the U.S. government and pro was an advisor in a lot of work going on in Central America. And a lot of the research and, and tactics and warfare that were going on to promote America's will in places like Guatemala and El Salvador and Panama and so forth um, were the result of those teachings and those philosophies. It's about market integration. Um, and what it led to was outside interference with internal affairs. It, it led to an, uh, a trespassing upon you know, national sovereignty. And um, it laid the groundwork for, you know, I mean, I'm not a, I don't want to make mass generalizations because it's a very complicated topic to break down to just a minute. But what, what I'd say is that it opened the door for corporations to supersede sovereigns globally. And that's what we have today. Are we all neoliberals? We definitely sh shop at and buy products that are, are the result, direct result of it. So we espouse those philosophies. It's actually in a lot of art talk and a lot of lingo. Um, uh, we're disciplined to speak it without knowing what we're saying. We're disciplined to believe in it as the ultimate determining mechanism for moral and ethical dilemmas. Let the market decide. Classic. So that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, but it is a complicated. So book, long history. Well, as a liberal, I guess, I, which I consider myself. It has nothing to do with, yeah, it's, it's about it's market it's liberalization. The yeah, market liberalization. It has nothing to do with liberal politics. Though, some of our most violent neoliberals have been Democrats. Yeah. You know, Clinton. Yeah. Uh, probably the most violent. And then, uh, Obama would be right up there with Reagan as a neoliberal and as the great deporter. He still deported more Mexican nationals and Central American nationals than Trump ever got to. So 
Yeah. We vote for them. We read their books. Well, sometimes the alternatives are worse. We don't know the alternatives, do we? Yeah. We just we believe in one monocratic system. Yeah. 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 We may find out. That's what we all, hope. I think that's what we need. Fascism. I don't know if fascism is an economic philosophy. It's more of a political philosophy than an economic. Can you separate economic from political that much? Oh. It seems like they're very, very much entwined. They, they can be. They often are. We have time for a few more questions. Any other questions? Well, um, the sovereignty of context is if you the best way to explain it is the way I tried to um, I'll just give you that disclaimer uh, then I'll add to it um, it's the realization of the of intense interconnectedness around a shared goal that takes on a will of itself the goal has a will irregardless of the people attached to it everything that is interconnected is in service of that will and the that provides a context for sovereignty to exist outside of states, outside of publics, outside of politics, outside of geopolitical dynamics. It is not sustainable for a long period of time because it exists within a larger context where the sovereigns ultimately have the power. Um, but for moments, you can create portals where you can experience the power of, a sh of an interconnected aspiration or of an aspiration bound by interconnectedness uh, across multiple points, facets, across that are social, political, economic, environmental, um, uh, nefarious, that sort of thing. Just on that point, yeah. what, what's the relation, in, to your thinking, what's the relationship of sovereignty to, the, to understandings about the commons? What sovereignty are you referring to? Well, you're, you're talking about the sovereignty of context. Yeah, the, yeah, a larger understanding of sovereignty, and and what's its relate? I, I sense there's a relationship to also the concept of the commons, that many things are not private property or public, but in fact something we all share and steward together for the for the greater good. That's a really good articulation of it right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's what's great about talking and sharing ideas is we get to build on it and we get to add to it. And, um, but yeah, there is a commons. There are things that are bigger than us that we really, do we have the authority to regulate? Do we have the authority to own? Do we have the authority to think that a boundary can divide it, you know, um, it's it's really really tough. Um, not, yeah. not not a question, but just yeah. one response yeah. to your discussion about economics and so on. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, John Maynard Keynes, uh -huh. who you know about and yeah. others do. 
he once, uh, he had a, there's a beautiful quote, not related to economics, uh -huh. but he, he wrote, uh, words ought to be a bit wild, for they are the assault of thoughts upon the unthinking. <laughs> that is, you could spend weeks untangling that one. That's he, really, he was very much really dense. He, he hung around with poets and the, the Bloomsbury writers in oh. England and uh, Virginia Woolf and people like that. And he really was interested in, in poetry and, and the power of words. And he thought, you know, they should be a bit wild. And I think that's what sovereignty of context is. It's a wild space holder for thinking about those portals and those dynamics, you know. Um, it's a work in progress. And our, uh, I would love to work with Roberto to publish a, a, a book um, and have a bunch of guest writers and, you know, really edit a book uh, with that goal. Um, but it, it's wild to you know, the, the repellent fence revealed something that we never thought we'd experience. Um, we worked for eight years on that project, and it was only exhibited for four days. And for one year, this was going to be located in a particular area. And then two months before the exhibition, we were informed by Border Patrol that they couldn't secure that area anymore that it would be unwise to do that. And then we heard the degrees of separation between cartels and uh, ah. members of government uh, are zero. zero. <laughs> and uh, so we heard about another place that would be even better. And um, we went to a, a city council meeting in Agua Prieta and um, we were informed that there's another opportunity, don't worry is going to happen. Um, we went back to a city council meeting in Douglas and it was a big round table meeting with all the federal agencies, state agencies and so forth and they set aside this track of land for us to use. It just so happens that was a cartel's land. Oh. They set it aside for us. Oh my God. Yeah. And they wanted us to know that. <laughs> <laughs> and they told us that security wasn't necessary <laughs> and no one would shoot the balloons down wow. no one <laughs> yeah and that was a, that's the sovereignty of context I don't know how else to describe it you know at this point it's still an event and a metaphor and we're trying to build understanding around it but we're not the only ones to experience that sort of thing. Miracles happen to lots of people. Any other questions? All right. I was just wondering, in the eyes of the parachute, parachutes are not possible. Uh huh. So you contextualize that as prayer. As an extreme example, yeah. yeah. We're watching what seems to be a tail. Yeah. Uh, is, are those tail prayers or uh, is that something uh, that's Unfortunately, prayers can't save people from themselves all the time. You know, we can find comfort and sometimes healing and sometimes miracles, but sometimes they just fall to the ground. The thing that's interesting, though, there are three parachuters in this video. All three survived their fall from 10,000 feet to the ground. They did not die. But they had some severe injuries. Their lives are changed forever. But uh, yeah, they, they lived. And I didn't want to show the ground or it's, you know, I just wanted the anxiety of reaching for something that you can't get. You can't straighten out, you can't untangle. And you have an immediate 
non-negotiable deadline. You know, that, and I just love that. And the prayer is like, is just going online, finding those meetings and conferences. And some of them were council meetings and just making sure that everyone who's praying was Indian, you know, and that, that was my only goal was just to make sure of that one thing with that and to make sure I didn't show anyone dying, you know, because they all survived. They all, they all lived. It's miracles, each one. Well, thank you. Thank you. And sorry for running late.